Hi everyone, welcome to your History 100 lecture. As you know, the topic of this course is the Great Tear. The purpose of this lecture is to contextualize Stalin's tear for you. So we'll be covering the early Soviet Union, um, starting with Lenin and the Russian Revolution. And we're going to go through Stalin, through World War II, all the way to Khrushchev's secret speech in 1956. So that should contextualize the tear for y'all, and let's get started. So, overwhelmed with internal turmoil, Russia withdrew from World War I in 1917 through the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. From 1917 until 1922, Russia engaged in a civil war between various factions, including the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. Notably during the Civil War, Tsar Nicholas II, his wife, and their five children were murdered by communist revolutionaries. The murders made Nicholas II the last Tsar of the Russian Empire and ended over 300 years of the Romanov dynasty. The Soviet Union was established on December 30, 1922 and eventually consisted of 15 recognizable states. Today, we would call them Russia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Belarus, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Moldova, and Armenia. In 1924, the leader of the Russian Revolution, also called the Bolshevik Revolution, Vladimir Lenin, died of a brain hemorrhage at the age of 54. By 1928, Stalin had established himself as the next Soviet leader. Stalin instituted a flurry of changes. One of his first acts was to abolish Lenin's economic policy, NEP. His new policies can be placed into three primary categories, collectivization, industri industrialization, and cultural revolution. Stalin sought to convert the peasants that occupied rural regions into forced labor. Most peasants were farmers, and Stalin forced the peasants to collectivize their lands. Collectivization, like a collective or collection of people, forced independent landowners to consolidate their plots with those of surrounding landowners. These larger plots, called kolkhozis, became communal property and were intended to increase peasant productivity. By 1930, about 60% of peasants were part of the kolkhozis. Peasants who were wealthier and had more land than others were labeled as kulaks. Generally, kulaks were either killed, exiled in remote areas such as Siberia, or exiled locally. There were often government quotas on how many kulaks local party bosses should find, and the vast majority of peasants were very resistant to the idea of kulaks and collectivization itself. The sudden collectivization mandate disrupted farming patterns. Combined with poor harvests and the confisc confiscation of foodstuffs by the Soviet state, Ukraine, the North Caucasus region, and parts of Central Asia experienced intense famine in the early 1930s. Among those who died from starvation are about 4 million Ukrainians and at least 1 million Cossacks, though estimates differ among historians. Russia's defeat in the Russo-Japanese War in 1905 and their severely outdated technology in World War I made it undeniable that Russia, and later the Soviet Union, was behind much of the world in terms of modernization. In 1928, Stalin introduced the first five-year plan to rapidly industrialize. He devoted significant resources toward transportation, electrical power, machinery, and the development of iron and steel. He set production quotas that equated to approximately 101, excuse me, 111% increase in coal production, a 200% increase in iron production, and a 335% increase in electrical power. Peasants struggling in rural areas migrated to the cities to fill new industrial jobs, doubling the urban population. Prominent historians considered the peasant class virtually destroyed by the early 1930s. Due to famine and numerous uprisings, there was, a seri there was a sense of panic in the Kremlin in 1932. On November 8th of that year, Stalin's wife is found dead 
is found after dying from suicide. Historians debate the effect this had on Stalin, but there is evidence that many of Stalin's decisions regarding, quote, the path to revolution, end quote, had already been made at the time of her death. There are not any records of other women in his life after, however. A lesser known aspect of Stalin's first five-year plan was the emphasis on culture. The government funded a significant number of new buildings and art projects. New construction, for example, included the House of Government, which consisted of about 5,000 apartments where government employees in Moscow were required to live. Of course, for those at the top levels of the Kremlin, however. The apartments were meant to act as a prototype for the future of communist living. There was also a renewed importance of domesticity and the role of women in the home for both the House of Government and for civil society itself. In 1932, the first five-year plan was declared a success. It's worth noting that this is only four years into the first five-year plan. In January of 1934, Stalin convened the 17th Party Congress. There were speeches given by those who were formerly exiled, and they claimed they had been reborn. One exclaimed that if you feel it in your heart, your thoughts should merge with Comrade Stalin. Among those who gave speeches was Sergei Kirov. Kirov spent five years as the first secretary of the Azerbaijani Communist Party before moving to Leningrad to take a higher position. On December 1st, 1934, Kirov was shot and killed by 30-year-old Leonid Nikolaev. Kirov's death had a profound effect on government and, it's commonly, and is commonly cited as one of the triggers for the Great Terror. Immediately after, Stalin issued a decree asserting that all cases pertaining to terrorism must be closed within 10 days. Former Bolshevik officials Grigory Zinoviev and Lev Kamenev were arrested and tried for Kirov's murder in what became known as the Moscow Show Trials. Though they were not involved in Kirov's murder, they were forced to admit they had, quote, moral complicity, end quote. At first, they were found guilty and sentenced to 10 years. However, Zinoviev, Kamenev, and 14 other old Bolsheviks, quote unquote, were re retried in 1936. Charges including forming a terrorist organization, espionage, and poisoning were all used to convict the 16 of them. They were found guilty and executed by firing squad immediately. In the late 1930s and during the period of the Great Terror, which we're now discussing, it's important to understand that Stalin was the party and you don't question the party. If the party tells you you must confess, even if you didn't do what you're being accused of, refusing to confess would then be opposing the party. Police departments often received quotas, specific names, or specific groups to whom they should arrest. The more connected a person was, the more dangerous it was for them, mostly politically, of course. Men were imprisoned much more than women, and of course men were killed at much higher rates than women. Foreigners, or anyone who had an association with a foreign country, were also among the groups eventually targeted. These included, for example, persons of a nationality bordering the Russian Republic, or, for example, people who, um, we'll use Poland as an example, so people who had traveled to Poland previously, people who took Polish in college, or people who simply just lived close to the Polish border. After they were arrested, trials generally lasted three to five minutes. In Moscow, for example, those who were to be killed immediately were taken to one of two spots in the woods. Generally, family members were not informed of their loved one's murder. Between 1934 and 1941, approximately 7 million people went through the Gulag system. It's worth noting that this number does not include those murdered before they could reach a Gulag. During this same period, there was also, ironically, an emphasis on consumer goods and happiness, 
There were live shows, radio, department stores, the return of the Imperial Ballet, theaters, and circuses. The tango became popular and people competed in violin competitions. Ration cards were abolished in 1936 so people could enjoy their food. Even New Year's was permitted to be celebrated with Christmas rituals since Christmas was illegal until 1935. And here, of course, is the map of the Gulag system, which you'll also find in the canvas. Every little tiny circle is a Gulag in the Soviet Union. So it's, it's quite a lot of Gulags. So moving to World War II. For the Soviet Union, World War II really began on June 22, 1941, when Hitler invaded their ter territory. There are several reasons why the USSR struggled during World War II that are specifically related to Stalin's purges. For one, much of the officer corps died or were sent to the Gulag in the 30s, so the military had few skilled officers left to rely upon. There is also evidence that peasants often defected to Germans because they were struggling because of collectivization. Stalin used victories to celebrate the USSR, and yet the USSR had entered another period of mass starvation because of the war and the efforts towards the war. By the end of World War II, the Soviet Union had over 8.8 .8 million military deaths and an additional 15.2 million civilian deaths. The end of World War II brought on another wave of cultural changes. Because most of the casualties during the war were men, there was a campaign to present single mothers as honorable and significantly less talk of the legitimacy of children born out of wedlock. The focus on consumer goods from the 1930s was renewed, and notably, Stalin's public image became more divine. He was now presented in a military uniform, and the idea that he had power over life and death over everyone was pervasive. Stalin felt that by the end of World War II, the distinction between the party and the common person was completely eroded. They were one. There was also a rise in anti-Semitism and distrust of those not ethnically Russian, even though Stalin was from Georgia. Men were arrested for displaying Jewish nationalism, for example. Many Soviet scientists were also not ethnically Russian, which fueled an already existing distrust of academia. On March 5, 1953, Stalin died of a stroke in his dacha outside of Moscow. Lavrenti Beria, the head of the secret police at the time, was seen as the frontrunner to succeed Stalin. Nikita Khrushchev conspired against Beria and highlighted specifically his moral depravity, quote-unquote. Within a few months, Beria was in fact put on trial and executed. Beria's death made room for Khrushchev's rise to power. Secured as leader of the Soviet Union, on February 25, 1956, Khrushchev gave a speech to the 20th Party Congress entitled On the Cult of Personality and Its Consequences. In what became known as the Secret Speech, Khrushchev condemned Stalin and the cult of personality he created. He accused Stalin of violating the tenets of Marxism-Leninism, decimating the army leadership, mass deportations of ethnic groups, and much more. This was also the first time the Soviet government publicly acknowledged the Gulag system. Though the speech was technically secret, its transcript was leaked to Western press quite quickly. It's worth noting that after Khrushchev's speech, national groups who were previously deported began to return to Soviet Russia in large numbers. New laws prescribed that you couldn't convict an individual based on their intent alone. Single-family homes began to replace high-rise apartments, and minor issues such as problems at work or with your supervisor, for example, were now to be solved by the individuals instead of the secret police. Alrighty, thank you everyone. Though it's impossible to cover everything, you should now have a basic understanding of the early years of the Soviet Union, the Stalin years, and some insight into Khrushchev's secret speech. 
If you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email or you can post on the discussion board. Take care.